Hi, I'm Sarah. And I'm Megan. We're two moms with eight kids between us, from little to grown. We're in different areas of the country and in different stages of life. But we both know that motherhood's a lot easier when real moms share tips and encouragement. And remind you that it's really all going to be okay. We're not experts. We're parents who've been there. We're not perfect. We're real. Welcome to the Mom Hour. Hey, everyone, and welcome to the Mom Hour. I am Megan Francis here with Sarah Powers. Hey, Sarah. Hey, Megan. I'm super excited about this series we're doing. I am too, and I hope it's exciting to everyone who's finding us in their feed today by surprise. Um, But we are actually talking about traveling with kids for the next few days. There's going to be three bonus episodes in your feed, and we're taking kind of a slightly different take on travel every day. So I'm really excited about today's because I'm going to get to kind of interview you, Sarah, and talk about taking little kids on a trip and just keeping all the details taken care of, like making that home away from home feeling that I know was super important to you when you were traveling with littles. And definitely as we kind of come into this new world where we're going to have travel open up to us, maybe a little bit, I hope soon, or even just thinking about travel, like we're going to be thinking about um, things that maybe we haven't thought about in a year or longer. And some of you listening weren't even moms when this all started. So like, (laughs) it's just crazy to think about like some of our listeners our brand new moms who are, you know, now have their year old baby and are thinking, oh my gosh, like I might actually be going someplace for the first time. Yeah. It, there is so much built into this. And I just want to back up a little bit and kind of say that we know that doing a series on family travel here in March, 2021 is complicated because we know that people's comfort level with travel is very different at this moment and also that it's going to progress differently over the next several months, even though at the moment, at the time of this recording, um, there's some optimism about people getting to see vaccinated grandparents and, you know, hop in the car for a road trip. So um, one of the things we wanted to do with this series is not try to answer questions like, does my three-year-old have to wear a mask on an airplane or like, Because we don't know. We don't like, can (laughs) I, will the wedding I'm hoping to go to in August be able, like, can I bring my kids to that wedding? You know, like we, we are in the dark just as you all are, but we do get this feeling from our Facebook community and from talking to moms that there are a lot of questions out there. And like you said, Megan, so much has changed since moms last took their family on a trip of any kind that it's like we need to relearn and reestablish our confidence a little. So we're not offering like you know, post COVID travel tips that are really specific in this series, what we can do is we can tell stories from our past travel experiences, because really what it comes down to is I think reminding ourselves and remembering that sometimes when things don't go as planned or don't go, you know, how we hoped the memories still get made, the adventure still happens. And that's, those are the stories we tell years later. So that's kind of like the, I guess the angle we wanted to come at this series from. Um, I am really excited about all of that. And I want to just, I don't know, reiterate a point that I feel like I've made a couple times on the show recently, but definitely if not on the mom hour, it's been going through my head. Um, and that is that like we, right now we're having a a collective shared experience that everyone is going to going back out in the world for the first time at the same time after Mm -hmm. being kind of tucked away from the world at the same time altogether. And while that is definitely unique, um, the idea of not, of this being a first is not unique. Like everybody Mm. has a first time going out with a baby. Everybody has a first time traveling with a baby and a toddler or a three-year-old, like a newly potty trained child. Like every mom has those firsts. And I feel like it feels so loaded right now because we're all having some kind of first literally all at the same time. And it's, it makes it feel a little like more daunting than it, actually needs to be, or Mm -hmm. actually is like, it's daunting on an individual level always, but right now it's like both daunting individually and collectively, which makes it just feel bigger. Yeah, you're so right. And, and because we lived in a world where the CDC was literally telling us how we could and couldn't travel for a long time and and will still for some time, um, there's this weird thing where like, it's like, we have to ask permission or, or look, look for the correct way to do things. And like, moms already kind of have that issue. Like we already want to know what the right way to pack for an airplane trip with a toddler is, but now we really do because we have, we have absorbed this kind of, um, reality where there are rules 
there are there are right. actual like rules and right and wrong ways um supposedly to do things. So I guess this series is like the really gentle supportive nudge from Megan and Sarah to travel in the way that feels right to you when you're ready and just remember that you can plan as best you can and then the rest will just kind of happen. So we're going to spend yeah. today and tomorrow and Friday tackling that from different angles. And like you said, Megan, um, you're going to interview me today, which is a lot about I'm, I'm just picturing all the families going to visit the vaccinated grandparents. I know that's not everybody's situation, but it's a lot of people's. And whenever yeah. you haul your little family to someone else's house, it's different than like, you know, renting a cabin or heading to the beach for a little mini long weekend or something. When you're uh, merging households with extended family, there's just some different things to, that come up. And I did a lot of that. You did a lot of that. And you were very detail oriented about detail oriented about it and also always had an eye on things like naps and sleep schedules and space. So I know you're going to have some really great um, tips to share and maybe also some kind of like reality checks to share about yeah. how how sometimes even the best planning doesn't quite go the way <laughs> that you thought it would. Yeah, just a guess. Exactly. Just a guess. Just a guess. Okay. Yeah. I'm excited to dig into that. And I'm also really excited about our sponsor for this series, which is Regalo Baby. Yeah. And Sarah, when it comes to guessing, here's another guess. Something tells me a lot of your biggest stressors surrounding travel with babies and toddlers all had to do with sleep. Am I right about that? I mean, that's a gimme. That's so easy. (laughs) (laughs) So yes, we're very excited to introduce our sponsor, Regalo Baby. Regalo is a family owned company that makes affordable and super practical products for busy families. If you have a baby gate in your home, chances are it's a Regalo baby gate, but they also have a lot of fantastic products for families on the go, like great portable sleep solutions. Yeah. And as we were talking about, it's been a whole year since most families have really traveled, which means if you had a young toddler back a year ago, you've got a two-year-old now and getting an older toddler to sleep predictably while traveling is a whole nother story. So I am really in love with Regalo's My Cot Portable Toddler Bed. It folds down like a bag chair and will actually fit in your checked luggage. And then setup is super easy. You just unfold and put the fitted sheet on. That's it. It's a comfy space for toddlers ages two and up to sleep. And I always found that my two and three-year-olds loved having a special familiar sleep spot just for them when we were visiting the grandparents. It's such a great idea. Regalo Baby also has a couple portable bassinet options for infants. It is so smart to have a dedicated sleeping space for your child that feels cozy and safe for them while traveling, but I also know it can be a pain to lug heavy sleep systems around with all your other stuff. Totally agreed. And these would also be a great thing for grandparents to invest in and keep on hand for the grandkids now and in the future. Regalo's products are super durable, so these cots and bassinets should last through several kids. I also love that Regalo is truly a family business. It was started by a couple over 25 years ago, and now all three grown kids work at the company. Regalo Baby puts a big emphasis on work-life balance in their company, and their products are all about simplicity and functionality. While you're thinking about how and where your little ones will sleep on your next trip, check out regalobaby.com slash themomhour to browse and receive a special discount. That's regalobaby.com slash the mom hour for a discount on Regalo's collection of gear to make your life as a parent easier. Okay, Sarah. So let's dig in here. Um, First of all, talk about the kind of travel that you did when your kids were small. Sure. So uh, in case you're a newer listener, my husband grew up in Connecticut and also with his dad and stepmom in Chicago, alternatingly. Um, And we've always lived in the West, Arizona and California. So from the very, very beginning, I have two sets of in-laws in two very far away states. And we didn't really do any leisure travel at all for the first, like, I'm going to say 10 years of me being a mom. Uh, we, We had some wonderful trips and made some wonderful memories. And sometimes it did include like a beach or, you know, so it's not not complaining. But all of our trips were these very long distance trips to connect and see our extended family. And lots of them included events like weddings or family reunions, Mm -hmm. like bigger events, which can be a little stressful to take small children to. There's also a two and three hour time difference from the, from where I was living to those places. Uh, Lots of staying in homes that were someone else's with that someone else. So not like renting a VRBO or something, but like, you know, staying at the grandparents' house or at an aunt and uncle's house um, while they are also there. So merging, merging families. Um, 
So that was really our travel reality for the first many, many years. And, you know, we didn't know any different. It's not like I was like, oh, I wish we could just jet off to Cabo or something. Like we didn't have the money to do that. And we probably wouldn't have anyway. But um, looking back, it's it's striking that we did do big trips, but they were all in the name of kind of like big family gathering uh, weddings and, and, you know, just jetting off to the other coast to see the grandparents. So. Yeah. And that is a very different, I mean, it's all travel, but it's not vacation with a capital V the way we often think of vacation. So, um, yeah. And, and like, especially like combining your family with another family, that's like a whole Mm -hmm. different thing. So (laughs) yeah. Yeah. And that leads, that leads to a lack of control, right? So when there's an extended family involved, maybe there's an event like a wedding or reunion, you're not really in control of that (laughs) schedule. Right. And I know that you, you enjoy, um, a bit of like perhaps being in the driver's seat. So how was that for you, Sarah? Tell, tell us about that. Let's, let's dig into that. Um, and I know some (laughs) listeners can relate. Okay. So I'm going to kind of I'm going to later as we chat, I'll talk about what that felt like once we were there and actually doing the thing, going to the wedding. But right now I want to talk about like how it played out as we were planning. Cause I think this is something that I'm seeing a lot from in our listener group. Like, ah, like, how do I, like, how do I plan who's going to sleep where? And I'm thinking about this trip that's like four months out. And I have been there because I think the anticipation of the trip knowing there was some big event, um, like a family wedding, uh, a three hour time difference, like some big party. It was very overwhelming. Like I just spent a lot of time doing like time zone math, like, okay, maybe the baby will be down to one mat one nap by then. And maybe (laughs) that one nap because of the, because of jet lag, maybe I'll be able now, obviously we all listening know I was spinning my wheels, Megan. I'm I was borrowing trouble is the phrase that you like to say. Like there was nothing I could do in the moment to and there was control. no way to know either. No way like, to know whether your baby was actually going to drop a nap like that. And was nothing, not something none you of that know. thinking. Yeah. Right. None of that thinking or wheel spinning was going to make my baby chill out more <laughs> or sleep better right. or have fun or whatever it was. I was wasn't always sleep, but a lot of it was sleep. Um, so in hindsight, I can say, first of all, I got really good at planning trips like this. I, you know, I think I was a good packer. I was a good planner. I got the whole like, you know, check your stroller at security and like the flying through airports and the car seats and the rental cars. Like, so some of it served me because I, you know, we could do probably like another three part series on all my airplane trips. And and actually we have some episodes in the archives that we can link to on that. So some of it served me, a lot of it didn't serve me, right? Like a lot of it was truly that, that kind of wasted energy. And what I learned, what we'll dig into is that some things go as planned, some things don't. And, and all that worrying ahead of time didn't do me a whole lot of good, but you know, maybe it was practice. Maybe I was like, I was learning how to like, how to plan for trips. And some of that included over obsessing over things I couldn't control. Well, and it's also like that. I mean, we've talked about before the way the brain works through problems. The brain is a very fascinating thing, right? And mm-hmm. and sometimes I think the way it works through problems is anticipating problems that aren't problems uh, so that it can do all the math beforehand. So there is like a sweet spot there, I think. And, and you yeah. know, we all tend to, I think, go a little hard in one direction or the other until we, cor- until we correct ourselves, like, until we find where that middle ground is for us. And right. knowing that your middle ground and mine are always going to look a little different it's still a little bit of a less extreme version of what maybe we would have been like yeah. before. So, so let's talk about staying in other people's homes. Cause you did that a lot. Um, the, the grandparents, the in-laws, how did you handle being a guest when you also needed to plan ahead to make sure that your inner Sarah was at least cared for a little bit <laughs> and to make sure that your family had what they needed? Because I have a feeling um, that you being a real planner married to more of a free spirit, that, that probably tends to fall on you. Yeah. Yeah. It, it fell on me. And also I kind of brought it on myself just well, right, of, right. like I, fell, I needed fell something. On you, you sucked yeah. it in, like whatever yeah, it was. Exactly. Right. Yes. All right. So I guess I have a, a few like practical tips here and they all start with like opening the conversation well before we were getting on a plane to go to wherever we were going. I was in the position where I had very generous and helpful in-laws and the grandparents who wanted to, you know, get their home ready for us. So they'd say, like, can I go to the store? Can I pick up anything? And that was great. That may be your situation if you're listening. That may not. But for me, 
Um, that was wonderful. But at the same time, I also like there were certain things I knew we'd need that like I just wasn't probably going to put on their list. So I kind of tried to think of it as like if, like if they were off. Yeah, my, <laughs> my special brand of coffee. No, I'm just kidding. Right. Um, so, yeah. So often they would offer to help get the house set up. And that might be like, I mean, you know, the baby might need a place to sleep. So maybe they were borrowing a some kind of a portable crib or something like that. There were lots of logistical conversations ahead of time. Um, I found that ordering ahead from like online retailers, the things that I knew I would need, I knew about how much I would need. So diapers, mm-hmm. wipes, baby food um, was just a really easy thing for me to control and pop in an order um, where I just knew it would be waiting for us. So I always did that. Um, if they wanted to offer to like go to the grocery store for us, I would just I would make a list of things that I knew we weren't too picky about. So like if it was something where I had to have a certain brand of baby food, I I probably wouldn't put that on their list. It makes it stressful for the grandparent. Then your kid doesn't eat it. Like, so I guess I split the difference between, you know, allowing and, and, um, accepting help on planning ahead and then sending some stuff that I would order. Um, and then when we got there, I really did whatever the situation was like where we were sleeping and we've stayed in some tiny little, I mean, like a little cottage that's like, a um, across the street from a beach house that someone in Brian's family has that is probably like, I don't know, 700 square feet or something like, um, with all, it was four of us at the time, plus Brian's mom. And we've stayed in all kinds of family arrangements where we didn't have a lot of extra space. But whatever we were given, I obviously tried to be a gracious guest, but I also tried to kind of make that space work for my family and ask for what I needed, you know, politely. So like, I I mean, I think people have heard me talk about like I stuck my babies. I had my babies sleep in like bathrooms with the fan on or like a closet nearby, like anywhere where it was a little darker, a little quieter, Um, like asking for an extra electric fan for some white noise or so I guess um, trying to claim what I could in a way that wasn't like rude or overbearing. But for me, it was always like my kids were going to do best and we were going to have the most fun if I could get kind of like the fundamentals sorted away. So yeah, that's yeah. How I approached it. So, so this is a kind of a side question, but just thinking of myself back in the early scrappy days where I would sleep anywhere anyone offered me. And then at some point I started becoming a little more, um, like, like hotels became more, more my jam. And it's yeah. not always, I still plenty of times, you know, I'm not talking last year, of course, but like, I've still plenty of times will crash with family, but I have found that as I've gotten older, or maybe as my kids have gotten older, or maybe I'm just getting weary. Like I have a little more selective. So I'm wondering, I'm just curious if you've had a, the same experience where you find now that sometimes, sometimes it's just best for everyone for you to not try to bunk up where someone else puts you. Yeah. I think it's, we've been lucky that it's evolved naturally in that, um, everybody's living situation. We haven't had to cram our, our growing family. Like since my kids have been older and bigger and, you know, need a bed of their own. We haven't really had to do that. Brian's mom retired and actually bought her own little beach house that has enough room for us. And that happened around the time where like, again, yeah, we wouldn't have been smushing all together. So I think it just solved itself, but you're totally right. And my kids are I have a almost teenager now. Like it's it's not the the privacy, the space that we need now is very different from when they were babies. It's easier now in a lot of ways, but we do need more space. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's just just an aside question. So now going back to when you don't have control of your space again, what about sleeping arrangements or baby proofing? I know that is such a hot topic with our community. Like you're going yeah. and I remember that too, going in with your toddler into like a grandparent's house where they've got like the glass topped coffee table with the really sharp edges that are perfectly at eyeball height and things like that. And you're just like, uh, or like a high chair. Um, are you going to be expected to jiggle your baby on your knee every (laughs) meal for the next week? Right. So how did you deal with all that? Yeah, I, I think again, it kind of depends on how clued in your hosts are. And mine have been fairly clued in. Like they, you know, they want to help and they want to set up the space correctly. Um, but there's lots of options now for grandparents to like borrow, borrow stuff from a friend. There are places you can rent baby gear. They might be up for like, you might be able to help them make a couple key purchases, especially if you're like, like I was the first to have kids in the family. 
But knowing yeah. that there are going to be multiple grandchildren coming down the line, you they might get excited about like picking out a few key pieces to buy. Um, that then knowing that'll tuck away in the attic or the basement and they'll get to use it for all the grandkids. And so, you know, I'm, I'm very lucky in that department. I would say that I tried not to over, hmm, like the babies always did better with some sleeping and eating and feeding and baby proofing situations better than I thought they would. And then other things would crop up that I hadn't even anticipated. So over okay. time, I tried to like really kind of make sure that the absolute safety basics were covered. So for me, that would be a swimming pool and, and a flight of stairs. So obviously, like to me, those two things, we need to talk about those because they're really serious consequences. And they're um, very hard to manage. Uh, I, mean, I mean, they're they're just omnipresent. Like a flight right. of stairs is just there, right? There's yes. no getting rid of it. A swimming pool, it's kind of large. So, right. right. Yeah, and, yeah. And, the, and the potential consequences are really big for those two things you know, sharp corners or small objects. Like when you, when you get settled in a new space, I think there's a way to do it. That's not like rude or judgmental, but be like, Hey, you know, I don't want any of your stuff to get damaged or like, Oh my gosh, we had a run in with a coffee table like this. So would it be okay if I did X, Y, Z? So there's like, there's a little you can do before you go about making sure you have a safe place to sleep and you're not going to fall down the stairs or fall into a swimming pool. And then know that when you settle in again, like I talked about earlier, you're going to kind of claim that space in a, in the way that only a mom can, who knows her toddlers, Mm -hmm. right? Like, because Mm -hmm. the grandparents as well-meaning as they are, just don't know the ins and outs. Like even you and I have talked about how you, it's easy to forget even in the stage we're in what toddlers get into, right? Like when my nieces come, it's like, some toddlers are climbers, right? Some are climbers and some are like, um, cabinet, you know, rough like riflers like they're all different in the things that they get into so yeah that's like it's a little bit maybe forgetfulness but it's also just not knowing your specific kid yeah yeah I want to say one thing about sleep here too and that is that even as structured as I was about sleep at home and we've covered that um I learned pretty quickly that the sleep sharing and sleep locations could be pretty different on the road and we got back to our home habits very quickly so if your baby's always been in a crib, for example, and it makes the most sense to have them sleep with you on a short trip, it's not going to like, they're not going to never sleep in their crib again. I can tell you because I've done, I've done that. So, um, maybe just with, with a little bit of practice and experience, you realize that you're, the goal is not to recreate your exact home environment at the grandparents. I think the goal is more like safety basics and, and making sure that that you can enjoy a little bit of your trip because you're not constantly, you know, holding the baby because you can't set them down. So you want to solve for right. that, but you don't need to recreate the exact same environment that you have um, at home. And then don't forget that there's Targets and Walmarts nearly everywhere. Yes. And the first time you do this, you might end up running out for like a portable high chair. You know, there's many purchases we've made out of like accidental necessity. And then it's like, yeah. oh yeah, remember we bought that that one trip where like the the airline lost our lost our car seat and we bought that one. And, you know, so there's, unless you're going somewhere that's truly a retail desert, like you live in Megan, but even in your town, I bet but you even, could source. Even yeah. here, there's a, there's a CVS or like a Meyer or a Walmart. You, there's still places you can find, like it, you'd have to be in a pretty big retail desert to not be able to find a diapers or a bottle or, right. um, a, like one of those bumbo seats to put a baby right. in or something, you know? Right. So Yeah. Yeah. Well, okay. So you've gotten there, you've arrived, you've unpacked, you're settling in. Now, how do you, how do you like enjoy yourself? (laughs) I mean, that is like the, the golden question, right? Because I think sometimes there's just so much work happening. It's like, I remember the feeling of it. It just feeling like there was under the surface, like everyone saw my smiling, happy face, but like under the skin, there was just this bubbling activity level happening. And the anticipation of the problems that could happen and all of those things. Um, But you want to enjoy yourself, right? It's it's your vacation too. So how did you handle that? Well, I'm going to say sometimes (laughs) better than others. Well, I'm going to say I I did it better some trips than others. And also I adjusted my expectations way down so that I really wasn't thinking of this in terms of a traditional vacation. I was thinking of it as a family gathering, which has different a different connotation to it. 
that's not to say there aren't some ways uh, that's not to say I didn't enjoy them looking back. I'm really glad we did all these trips. Um, and I had moments that I enjoyed them, but it's a, it's a lot of work when your kids are small. And so maybe just knowing that and knowing that, that keeping those far away family connections, if that's something you want to do and are able to do is, is really meaningful. And and it's, it was worth it to me. Um, but here's something I noticed uh, just in terms of my own like mood and, and, you know, enjoyment or lack of lack thereof. There was always a rhythm to this kind of travel. And after a while, it became so familiar. So we talked about how I enjoy, I kind of enjoyed the planning and the packing and the prepping. I was good at that. It was, it was fun for me to anticipate the trip, especially these are the years where I was home with little kids all the time. So at right. least a trip was like novel, right? right. Um, and then the travel day itself was always like, like a really big challenge, but the kind that I almost liked to like rise to the occasion to, you know, Brian and I are working together and we're like, doing airport security like a pro with three little kids. And like, it was hard, but it was the kind of hard that I got good at and almost enjoyed. And the kids always did better on the travel day than I expected. They always Mm. did great because, well, I don't know why, but maybe, maybe it's an expectations thing. I was so worried about all the things that could go wrong (laughs) and they did great. And then you get there, you unpack. And that first night of sleep for us was always just a disaster. I mean, the, the time difference and the babies being in a different location and everything, like when you're, if you're breastfeeding, like your milk supply can get all weird. You're it's like all of a sudden it all comes crashing down on, on that first night of sleep. And that next day, and even, even two days, like kids are out of sorts and grumpy, you're sleep deprived. And you're like, why, like, why did we do this? This is not fun. And then lo and behold, like everyone hits their stride a little bit and, and we would kind of level out. So there are big highs and big crashes and, you know, being on the same page as my co-parent was really, really important. Just bringing him into my brain a little bit and making sure that the mental load was not exclusively mine. Even if it had been, I needed to then like offload some of it so that we could job share, you know, because he was, he was no longer working, right? If we were on a trip. So I might've taken the lion's share of the planning, but, um, that was key. And then, you know, what's funny is even though there's a ton of work that you're still doing as a mom, when you're traveling, um, once your kids warm up to the relatives and, you know, they're seeing new things and there might be some new toys to play with, you may actually get some breaks, uh, more than you do at home. That's what I found. So like, it was in some ways a lot more work. It's always more work to parent your kids out of their natural home environment. But I was getting more breaks too. Like, you know, somebody will want to hold the baby or like take a shift with the baby, you know, early in the morning and you get to sleep in or, you know, there are cousins to play with or whatever the thing is. So I think noticing and realizing that you are working harder, but you might also be getting a few breaks and and kind of leaning into those breaks. That was always helpful to me. Yeah, it's like that. Sometimes you have to work hard to set yourself up for less work. Um, yeah. So like the the heart, it's like you you go, 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 go. And then the reward is that grandma is going to take the baby for an hour and yeah. you get to chill. But you have to recognize that hour that you're getting to chill as part of the deal and not forget about it. Like in the yeah. way you look back at, at the experience. Right. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, and then this is like, this is a big one. I think we've gotten questions and and it's related to my enjoyment because if my kids are overtired and grumpy, I am not going to be enjoying myself. Um, but when it comes time to like set a boundary or, um, maybe put yourself out there a little bit with the kids schedule and say something like this toddler needs an app, like we can't possibly push through this day and go to that wedding tonight. Um, it can feel a little bit, uh, you know, like it can feel a little bit awkward, um, to have to put your family's priorities like up there with the greater family, the greater extended family. And, um, so for me, I always just, I kind of tried to own it as like our issue, you know, like I want everybody to have fun later tonight, but these kids are just going to be bonkers if they don't get a little bit of a rest. So like, how would the best way to do that be? What would that look like today? And, um, just be gentle. And I think with in-laws and grandparents, if we go in with the assumption that, everybody is doing their best and everybody wants for the most part, the same thing, which is a relaxed and enjoyable time together and giving, giving other generations the benefit of the doubt that they don't necessarily know or remember what it's like to parent two or three little kids who haven't had a nap. Um, Maybe they remember and maybe they're super sympathetic, but 
if they're not, it may not be because they're cruel people, but just that they right. haven't been there in a while. So um, I guess I'm, I'm kind of saying two things. One, don't be afraid to declare what your little family needs or to take an extra car so you can head out early and get the kids to bed. Um, and, and I, I wouldn't be afraid to, to state those needs, but also I think you can do it in a way that's not like divisive or criticizing yeah. or anything like that. Yeah. Well that, and I think also you don't have to absorb, I don't want to say blame. You don't have to res- absorb the responsibility of a nap schedule all on yourself. So like mm-hmm. I, I, and you know, I was always a little more relaxed and never really into the schedule, but when it was apparent that this was going to like, when I was at the beginning of a day going, Oh my goodness, I can't, I cannot drag my two-year-old through this whole day and then expect them to be in one piece this evening. I would just blame it on the baby. <laughs> yeah. Like, you know, Oh, looks like someone's was getting tired, even though they yeah. don't actually, they're not actually <laughs> exhibiting any signs of getting tired. That would also buy me time because sometimes that would mean like a four hour break from the madness yeah. for me. Like, cause you could say, Oh, okay. I've got to excuse us. Cause you know, Jacob's getting tired and sleepy and we need, to, we need a break. And then yeah. it might actually be an hour and a half before he would actually settle down enough to take a nap. But like I've, without having to say, sorry, nap time is two o'clock. I'm out. It yeah. was more like things are about to get really crazy if we don't shut this down. So yeah. there's lots of ways to kind of what, like tap dance your way around that. Right. Yeah. I love that. Yeah. Well, Sarah, that is all so helpful. And I think that you're, I think that all the mindset stuff that you've been talking about today is going to really um, play forward really nicely and segue into days two and three, because really this is all about mindset, right? Like there's so much about like that you cannot control and you can yeah. have the right gear that helps. You can make the plans that helps, but really like the way you kind of set yourself up for success mentally is probably the biggest, I don't know, piece of the puzzle that um, you have, you have control over. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, we want to thank Regalo Baby as our sponsor for this series and today's episode and remind you all to check out regalobaby.com slash the mom hour where you can get a special discount on all kinds of gear to make your life as a parent easier. And especially if you're going to be traveling this year, definitely check that out at regalobaby.com slash the mom hour. Yeah. And speaking of things beyond your control, um, tomorrow's episode, we will be talking with Chelsea, a full-time working mom with a toddler who is living and working full-time on the road in a camper. Uh So she's gotten real. Well, I, I won't, you know, tease too much, but, um, I will say that during our recording session, she had to run to a local Walmart to buy new earbuds. And when she met with you, she was on a camp chair. So like, this is like her reality. And so it's, yeah. it's really fun. It's like, she's like really living a very different, very different kind of travel than most of us ever will. But I found her, um, just to be very insightful. I agree. And you know, makes all of my silly obsessing over like a three hour time change look like nothing. Cause she's re- truly traveling the country with her husband and their toddler in a, in an RV. Um, and so that's going to be really fun. So come back for that. That'll be part two in our series airing tomorrow. And then on Friday, we will be back again and I'm going to interview you, Megan. So between the three days, you'll hear three very different traveling perspectives. Um, and then just check the show notes wherever you're listening or at the and you'll find links to everything we talked about today and more about the series and our sponsor Regalo baby. We'll talk to you tomorrow. 